the mission of truth. We rounded off our lecture on the mission of anger, Prometheus Bound title, with the words of Heraclitus, quote, Never will you find the boundaries of the soul by whatever paths you search for them. So all-embracing is the soul's being. Close quote. We have acquainted ourselves with this infinite scope in the workings and interplay of the powers of the soul. And the truth of Heraclitus's words come home to us especially clearly when we continue along the lines from which we set out yesterday, the innermost core of the human being. Our starting point was that we are most spiritual in our ego. The ego is the member of our being that we have in addition to those we have in common with the three lower kingdoms of nature. We have, as we know, our physical body in common with the minerals, plants, and animals, the etheric body in common only with the plants and animals, and finally the astral body in common only with the animals. Through our ego we can first become man in the true sense and are able to evolve from stage to stage. It is this ego that works on the other members of our being. It cleanses and purifies the instincts, inclinations, desires and passions of the astral body and will lead the etheric and physical bodies to ever higher stages. But if we look closely at the ego, we find that this worthy member of our being is imprisoned, as it were, between two extremes. Through our ego we are intended increasingly to become beings centered in ourselves. Thoughts, feelings and will impulses should come from our ego. The firmer and richer our center is, the more we will have available to give to the world, the more effective our actions will be. If we are unable to find this center in ourselves, we will be in danger of losing ourselves through a misconceived activity of the ego. We would lose ourselves in the world and be ineffectual in life. Or we may lapse into the other extreme. Just as we may lose ourselves if we fail to strengthen and enrich our ego, we can, on the other hand, if we think of nothing but developing our ego, fall into the other fatal extreme of selfish isolation from all human community. So egoism, with its hardening and secluding influence, can also divert the ego from its proper path. The ego is confined within these two extremes. If we now give our attention to the human soul, we see that we have at the present time what we call the sentient soul, rational or perceptive soul, and consciousness soul. We began by recognizing, surprisingly perhaps for some people, that anger acts as a kind of educator of the soul. A one-sided view of the lecture on the mission of anger could lead to many objections. But if we go into the underlying significance of this view of anger, we shall find an answer to many important riddles of life. In what respect is anger, an educator of the soul, particularly of the sentient soul, and the forerunner of love? We can ask whether anger does not tend to make people lose control of themselves and get carried away so that they engage in wild, immoral, and loveless behavior. If we think only of wild, unjustified outbursts of anger, we have a wrong idea of what was said about the mission of anger. It is not through unjustified outbursts that anger educates the soul, but through what it does within the soul. To visualize the way anger works in the soul, let us imagine two teachers faced with children who have done something wrong. One teacher will lose his temper and immediately punish the child. The other teacher may not be capable of letting go in anger, yet neither is he able to do the right thing out of full self-control from out of his ego in the sense described yesterday. What will be the difference between the actions of these two teachers? An outburst of anger involves more than the punishment imposed on the child, 
anger stirs the soul, working upon it so as to destroy selfishness. Anger acts like a poison on selfishness, and we find that in time it gradually transforms the powers of the soul, making it capable of love. Whereas the teacher, who has not yet attained inner tranquility, and yet inflicts a coldly calculating punishment, will, since anger does not work in him as a poison, become an increasingly cold egoist. As we see, anger works inwardly, and it can therefore, as a soul quality, be regarded as a regulator for unjustified outbursts of selfishness. But anger must be there, otherwise we would not have to combat it. Through overcoming anger, the soul progresses more and more. If we want to achieve something that we consider right and get angry over it, this anger will damp down the egoistic forces in us and release their effective power. Just because anger is overcome and people free themselves from it and rise above it, their selflessness will be enhanced and this strengthens their ego. The scene of this activity between anger and the ego is the sentient soul. A different interaction between the soul and other soul experiences takes its course in the rational or perceptive soul. Just as our soul has attributes that it must overcome in order for us to progress, it must also cultivate forces that are, so to speak, acceptable, however spontaneously they may arise in us. We have to have forces in us to which we can open ourselves. And when we assert ourselves are not weakened but strengthened. The outstanding element in us which the soul may love, educating us, not to egoism but to selflessness, is truth. Truth educates the rational or perceptive soul. While anger is an attribute of the soul that must be overcome if a human being is to rise to higher stages, truth should be loved right from the beginning. An inner cultivation of truth is essential to the soul's progress. What is the characteristic quality in truth that in its service brings human beings ever further? Truth has its opposite, namely lies and error. Let us look at the way human beings advance in so far as they overcome error and lies and pursue truth as their great ideal. A higher form of truth must be the aim of human endeavor, whereas human beings must treat anger as an enemy to be increasingly abolished. Truth has to become an ideal that they shall love and become one with. Nevertheless, eminent poets and thinkers have rightly claimed that full possession of truth is beyond human reach. Lessing, for example, says that pure truth is not meant for human beings, but only a perpetual striving toward it. He speaks of truth as a distant goddess whom human beings may approach but never reach. In fact, it is the striving for truth that enables the soul to progress. Since there is this everlasting search for truth, and truth is so manifold in meaning, all we can reasonably say is that human beings must grasp what truth is and kindle in themselves a genuine sense of truth. Therefore we do not speak of a single all-embracing truth. In this lecture we will consider the idea of truth in the proper sense, And it will become quite clear that by cultivating a sense of truth, people's inner life will acquire a driving force that leads them to selflessness. Human beings strive toward the truth. Yet when people have sought to form views about things, we find that in the most varied realms of life, conflicting opinions arise. When we see what different people have considered to be true, We might think that the striving for truth leads to the most contradictory views and standpoints. If, however, we look impartially at the facts, we shall find clues that show us why it is that people arrive at such a diversity of opinions, although they are all searching for the truth. 
An example will explain this. The American millionaire Harriman, who died recently, was a rarity among millionaires in that he concerned himself with thoughts of general human interest. His aphorisms, found after his death, include a remarkable statement. He wrote, quote, Nobody in this world is indispensable. When one goes, another is there to take his place. When I lay down my work, another will come and take it up. The railways will continue running, dividends will be paid as usual. It is basically the same with everybody. Close quote. So, this man arrived at the generally valid truth. Nobody is indispensable. Let us compare this statement with a remark by a man who worked for many years in Berlin and acquired great distinction through his lecture courses on the lives of Michelangelo, Raphael, and Goethe. I am referring to the art historian Hermann Grimm. When Treitschke died, Hermann Grimm wrote of him in one of his essays roughly as follows. Now Treitschke is gone, and people only now realize what he accomplished. No one can take his place and continue his work the way he did it. One has the feeling that in the circle where he taught, everything has changed. An interesting point is that Hermann Grimm did not repeat the expression, quote, and it is like this with everybody, close quote. Here we have two men, the American millionaire and Hermann Grimm, who arrive at exactly opposite truths. What does it depend on? If we compare the two approaches, we shall find a clue. Bear in mind that Harriman centers what he says on the statement, quote, When I lay down my work, someone else will continue it. Close quote. He does not get away from himself. Whereas the other fellow leaves himself entirely out of account. He neither speaks of himself nor asks what sort of opinions and truths others might gain from him. He merges himself in the subject. Anyone with a feeling for the matter will have no doubt as to who is right. He need only ask, who carried on Goethe's work when he laid it down? We can feel that Harriman's reflections suffer from the fact that he did not get away from himself. So we can begin to draw the conclusion that it prejudices truth if the people in search of it cannot get away from themselves. Truth is best served if one can get away from oneself. In fact, is truth the kind of thing that gives us only one aspect of it? A viewpoint is a kind of thought reflection of the outer world. When we form a thought about something and continue our thoughts along the same lines, does it follow that this is a correct picture? Suppose you take a photograph of a remarkable tree. Does this one photograph give a real picture of the tree? It shows the tree from one aspect only, not the whole reality of the tree. No one could form a true image of the tree from this one photograph. How could people who had not seen the tree find out more about it? If the tree were photographed from four sides, then they could collate the photographs and finally arrive at a true picture of the tree. This mental image of the tree has been arrived at independently of any one person's individual viewpoint. Now, let us apply this example to human beings. People who leave themselves out of account when making observations are in the same position as the photographer who goes all round the tree. They eliminate themselves through the force of their own personality. If in forming an opinion or taking a certain view we were to realize that all such opinions depend on our personal standpoint, our habits of mind and our individuality, we would then try to eliminate these influences from what we call the truth. Then we shall be acting as the photographer did in our example. The first requirement for acquiring a genuine sense of truth is that we should break away from ourselves and see clearly how much depends on our personal point of view. If the American multimillionaire had got away from himself, he would have known that there was a difference between himself and other people. An example from everyday life has shown us that if people fail to realize how much their personal standpoint or point of departure influences their view, they will arrive at restricted opinions, not the truth. 
This is apparent also on a wider scale. Anyone who looks at genuine spiritual development and compares all the various, in quotes, truths that have arisen in the course of time will find, if they look deeply enough, that when people pronounce a truth, they ought first of all to get away from their individual outlooks. It will then become obvious that the most varied opinions about truth arise because people do not recognize to what extent their views are restricted by their personal standpoints. A less familiar example may lead to a deeper understanding of the matter. If we want to learn more about beauty, we turn to aesthetics, which deals with forms of beauty. Beauty is something we encounter in the outer world. How do we get at the truth about beauty? Here again we must free ourselves from the restrictions imposed by our personal characteristics. Take, for example, the 19th century German aesthete Solger, Solger, who wanted to investigate the nature of beauty in accordance with his idea of truth. He could not deny that we meet with beauty in the external physical world, but he was a man with a one-sided theosophical outlook, and this was reflected in his theory of aesthetics. His interest in a beautiful picture was confined to the shining through it of the only kind of spirituality he recognized. For him, an object was beautiful only in so far as it manifested spirituality. Zulger was a one-sided theosophist who set out to explain sense-perceptible phenomena in terms of the supersensible, but he forgot that sense-perceptible reality has a justified existence on its own account. Unable to escape from his preconceptions, he tried to rise to the spiritual level by way of a misconceived theosophy. Another aesthete, Robert Zimmermann, came to the exactly opposite conclusion. As against Zolger's misconceived theosophical aesthetics, Zimmermann based his aesthetics on a misconceived anti-theosophical outlook. His sole concern was with symmetry and anti-symmetry, harmony and discord, and he had no interest in going beyond the beautiful to that which manifests through it. So his aesthetics was as one-sided as Zolger's. Every attempt at striving for truth can be spoilt by the seeker failing to recognize that the first thing he must do is to get away from himself. This can be achieved only gradually, but the distinguishing mark of truth is that in order to obtain its help, in it challenges us in the strictest way to leave ourselves out of account and forget everything else. Truth has this unique characteristic. We can strive for it while remaining entirely within ourselves, yet, while living in our ego, we can acquire something which, fundamentally speaking, has nothing to do with the personal self. Whenever people are driven to have their own way, what drives them is egoism. When they want to do something they think is right, but someone else stands in the way, they get angry, which is an expression of self-seeking. But if they are bent on attaining the truth, this self-seeking must be subdued. So, truth is something we experience in our inner being, and yet it liberates us increasingly from ourselves. It is, of course, essential that in our striving for truth absolutely nothing else comes into it but our love of truth. If passions, instincts, and desires come into it, from which the sentient soul must be cleansed before the rational soul can strive for truth, they will prevent us from getting away from ourselves and will keep the ego tied to a fixed viewpoint. In the search for truth, the only passion that must not be discarded is love. Truth is a lofty goal. This is seen in the fact that truth, in the sense intended here, is recognized today in one limited realm only. It is only in the realm of mathematics that humankind in general has reached this goal. For here human beings have curbed their passions and desires and do not permit them to have a say. 
Why does everyone agree that 3 times 3 equals 9 and not 10? Because they do not allow emotion to come into it. In this single matter of mathematics, humankind have now reached the point of silencing their passions. If we had not reached this point, many a housewife would appreciate only having to give ninety pence for one pound, if passions still had something to do with it. It is therefore essential in any search for truth that we silence our instincts and desires. Human beings would agree on the greatest truths if they had come as far with them as they have with the truths of mathematics. We grasp the truths of mathematics in our inmost soul, however, and because we grasp them in this way, we have really got hold of them. If a hundred or even a thousand people were to contradict us, we would still know that three times three equals nine, because we have inwardly grasped it as a fact. If the hundred or thousand people who take a different view were to get away from themselves, they would arrive at the same truth. What then is the way to mutual understanding and the unity of humankind? We understand one another in the field of numbers because here we have met the required conditions. To the extent that we arrive at the truth, there will be peace and harmony among human beings. This is the essential thing, that we shall seek for truth, knowing that it is something we can only find in our innermost hearts and that it is truth that will time and again bring us together, because its light shines in the innermost depths of the soul of each one of us. It is truth that lights up the path of human beings, leading them to unity and mutual understanding, and it is also the herald that prepares the way for justice and love. Truth is the kind of herald we should especially cultivate, while the other kind which we become which we became acquainted with yesterday, must be overcome if we want to be helped with the overcoming of selfishness. It is the mission of truth to become the object of increasing love, care, and devotion on our part. By opening ourselves to truth, truth becomes all the stronger, and we are released from the self. Whereas anger weakens us, truth strengthens us. Truth is a stern goddess. She demands to be at the center of a unique love in our souls. The moment one fails to get away from oneself and prefers something else to her, she takes immediate revenge. The poet Coleridge made a statement which typifies how human beings should relate to truth. He says, Those who love Christianity more than truth will soon find that they love their own Christian sect more than Christianity and then find that they love themselves more than their sect. A great deal is implicit in these words. Above all, they signify that to strive against truth leads straight to a humanly degrading egoism. Love of truth is the only love that sets the ego free. And directly people give preference to anything else, they inevitably fall prey to self-seeking. This is all we can expect if we have less respect for truth than anything else. This spells out its implacable earnestness, but also its greatness and immense importance in the education of the human soul. Truth conforms to no one, and only by devotion to truth can truth be found. Directly people prefer themselves and their own opinion to the truth, they become antisocial and they alienate themselves from human community. Look at people who make no attempt to love truth for its own sake, but parade their own opinions as the truth. They care for nothing but the contents of their own soul and become the most intolerant of people. Those who love truth in the form of their own views and opinions will not tolerate someone else who seeks truth along another path. They put obstacles in the way of anyone who comes from a different background and who therefore forms different opinions from their own. Hence the conflicts that so often arise in life. Honest striving for truth leads to human understanding, but the love of truth for the sake of one's own personality leads to intolerance and the destruction of other people's freedom. 
Truth takes root in the rational or perceptive soul. The actual search for truth and the acquiring of truth through our own effort is something we can do only because we are thinking beings. Inasmuch as truth is acquired by thinking, we must realize very clearly that the whole area of truth falls into two parts. Truth takes two forms. There is the kind that comes from observing the world of nature around us and investigating it bit by bit in order to discover its truths, laws and wisdom. And this kind of truth which we come to when we contemplate the whole range of our experience of the world in this way can be called the truth of reflective thinking. We saw yesterday that the whole of nature is permeated with wisdom, that wisdom lives in all things. In a plant that lives the idea of the plant, excuse me, in, the, in a plant there lives the idea of the plant. And we can acquire this living element, this wisdom in the plant, in the form of an idea. This is how human beings relate to the world, and we can infer that the world is born of wisdom and that by means of our thinking we can rediscover the element that was engaged in the creation of the world. This is the kind of truth we acquire through reflective thinking. But there are also other truths. These cannot be acquired merely by reflective thought, but only by going beyond what can be given us in outer life. In ordinary life we can easily see that when people construct tools, instruments, they have to formulate laws that are not given from outside. For example, no one could learn from the outer world how to construct a clock, for the laws of nature are not so arranged as to provide for the appearance of clocks as a natural product. This is the second kind of truth. We come to it by thinking out something not given us by observation or experience of the outer world. So there are two kinds of truths, and they must be kept strictly apart. Those that arise from external observation by means of reflective thought, also called Nachdenken, and those that arise through creative thought, called Vordenken. How can truths of this kind be verified? What makes them true? The inventor of a clock can spend a lot of time spent giving us proof that he thought it out correctly, but we shall only give him our confidence if he can show us that the clock does what he expects. Anything we think out in advance must prove itself in practice and yield results that can be recognized. The truths of spiritual science or anthroposophy are of this kind. We cannot learn about them in the first place from our outer experiences. For example, no findings in the realm of outer nature can confirm the truth we have often dwelt on concerning the immortal kernel of the human being, the truth that the human ego appears again and again on earth in successive incarnations. Those who aspire to this truth will never arrive at it through outer observation, but must raise themselves above outer experience. They must grasp in their souls a truth that they do not yet experience in life, but which they must prove to be true in outer life. A truth of this kind cannot be proved in the same way as truths of the first kind, which are gained by what we call reflective thought. We can only prove them by showing how they apply in life and are reflected there. If we look at life with the knowledge that the soul repeatedly returns and ever and again goes through a series of events and experiences between birth and death, we shall find how much satisfaction, how much strength and productivity these thoughts can bring. Or, again, if we ask how the soul of a child can be helped to develop and grow stronger, presupposing that an eternally existent soul is here working its way into a new life, then this truth will shine in on us and give proof of its fertility in outer reality. Any other proofs are false. The only way a truth of this kind can be confirmed is by proving it true in daily life. 
truths that have been actually arrived at in thought and not through external observation cannot be proved in the same way as reflective truths. They have to prove their worth and show their fruitfulness in life itself. There is a vast difference between these two kinds of truth. Those of the second kind are grasped in the spirit and verified through outer observation. What then is the educational effect of these two kinds of truth on the human soul? It makes a great difference whether people work just with those truths that come to them on reflection or just those that they conceive creatively. Let us take a look at what we acquire from reflecting on truth. If we steep ourselves in the wisdom of nature and create in ourselves a true reflection of it, we can rightly say that we have in ourselves something of the creative activity from which the life of nature springs. But here a distinction must be made. While nature's wisdom is directly creative and gives rise to the reality of nature in all its abundance, the truth we acquire through thinking is only a reflection of it, a passive image, which our reflective thinking has rendered powerless. We may indeed acquire a wide, open-minded picture of the world's truth, but the creative, productive element has been removed. Therefore, the initial effect of this picture of truth on the development of the human ego is desolating. The creative power of the ego is lamed and devitalized. The self loses strength and can no longer stand up to the world if it is concerned only with reflective thoughts. Nothing does so much to isolate the ego, to make it withdraw into itself and to look with hostility on the world as merely reflecting on it. People can become cold egoists if they are intent only on investigating the outer world. What do they want this knowledge for? Do they mean to place it at the service of the gods? If people desire only this kind of truth, they want to have it for themselves and they are on the way to becoming cold egoists and misanthropists in later life. They will become recluses or will sever themselves from humanity in some other way, for they want to possess the content of the world as their own truth. All forms of seclusion and hostility toward humanity can be found on this path. Souls become increasingly dried up, and lose their sense of human fellowship. They become ever more impoverished, although the truth should be enriching. Whether people turn into recluses or one-sided eccentrics makes no difference. In both cases, a hardening process will overtake their soul. So the more we see people confining themselves to this kind of thought, reflective thought, the less productive their souls will be. Let us try to understand why this is so. Suppose we are looking at nature out there and we have before us an array of plants. They have been formed by the living wisdom that calls forth their inherent productive power. Now an artist comes along and his soul confronts the picture that nature sets before him. He does not merely reflect on it, but lets nature's creative power work upon him. He creates a work of art which does not contain merely a reflective thought, but a productive force. Then someone appears who tries to get behind the picture and extract a thought from it. He reflects on it. And in this way its reality is filtered down and at the same time impoverished. Now try to carry this process further. Once the soul has extracted a thought from the observation of the picture, The matter is concluded and the soul has finished with it. All one could still do would be to formulate further thoughts about the thought. But this is to enter the realm of the ridiculous and the process fizzles out of its own accord. It is quite different with creative thinking. In this realm human beings relate in a different way 
as they themselves are productive. They bring their thoughts to realization in life. Here they are working according to nature's own example. This is how it is with us when we go beyond mere observation and reflective thinking and make space for something to arise in our souls that we cannot get from mere observation. All spiritual scientific truths are of this kind. They require a productive disposition of soul. Where these truths are concerned, all mere reflective thinking is harmful and leads to deception. On the other hand, truths attainable by creative thought have something else about them. And that is that human beings can only attain these truths in a limited area. For where the creative wisdom of the world is concerned, human beings are incompetent bunglers. There is no end to the things from which we can derive truths by reflective thought, and only a very limited field where it is possible for us to attain truths by creative thought. Yet, because the field open to us is more restricted, the productive forces increase and our souls are refreshed and expand further and further. In fact, the soul becomes more and more inwardly divine when it reproduces in itself the essence of the divine creative activity in the world. This is how different the two kinds of truth are, the one reached by creative thought and the other by reflective thought. The latter kind, derived from investigating existing things or current experience, will always lead to abstractions, and the soul will be deprived of nourishment and dry up. The truth that is not acquired from outer experience, however, is creative, and by the force of its own strength it assigns human beings a place in wider existence, where they can cooperate in shaping the future. The past can actually be approached only by reflective thought, while creative thought opens a way into the future. Man becomes a responsible creator of the future. Human beings extend the power of the ego into the future, insofar as they come to possess not merely the truths derived from the past by reflective thinking, but also those that are gained by creative thinking and point toward the future. Herein lies the liberating influence of creative thinking. Those people who are active in their striving for truth will soon find how much reflective thinking impoverishes them, and they come to understand that the devotees of reflective thinking are filling their minds with phantom ideas and bloodless abstractions. Such people may feel like outcasts, condemned to a mere savoring of truth, and may come to doubt whether they have any spirit to play a part in shaping the world. On the other hand, if we experience a truth acquired by creative thinking, we shall find that it nourishes and warms the soul, and gives it new strength at every stage in life. It fills us with joy when we are capable when we are able to grasp truths of this kind and discover that in connecting them up with the phenomena of life we can say to ourselves now I not only understand what is going on there but I can now explain it in the light of having known something about it previously with spiritual scientific truths we can also approach man the human being cannot be understood if we are acquainted only with reflective thinking. But with spiritual scientific truths, the human being becomes more and more comprehensible, and our feeling of unity with the world and our interest in it are continually enhanced. We experience joy and satisfaction at every confirmation of spiritual scientific truths that we encounter. This is what makes these truths so satisfying that we have first to grasp them before we can find them corroborated in actual life, and all the while they enrich us inwardly. We get away more and more from ourselves, whereas reflective thinking leads to subtle forms of egoism. In order to find confirmation of truths gained by creative thinking, 
We have to go out from ourselves and look for their application in all realms of life. It is particularly these truths that liberate us from ourselves and fill us in the highest degree with the requirements for a sense of truth. Feelings of this kind have been alive in every genuine seeker after truth. They were deeply present in the soul of Goethe when he made the grandiose and most illuminating statement, quote, only that which is fruitful is true, close quote. But Goethe was also well aware that human beings must be intimately connected with truth if they are to understand one another. Nothing does more to estrange people from one another than when they become alienated from a search for a sense of truth. Goethe also made the statement, quote, A false doctrine cannot be refuted, for it is based on a conviction that the false is true. Close quote. Obviously there are untruths that can be logically disproved, but that is not what Goethe means. He was convinced that a false viewpoint cannot be refuted by logical conclusions and that the fruitful application of truth in practical life should be our sole guiding principle in our search for truth. It was because Goethe was so deeply attached to the truth that he was able to sketch the beautiful and true drama title Pandora, which he began writing in 1807. Pandora is only a fragment, yet it is one of the most mature fruits of Goethe's abundant creativity. Despite the fact that it is only a fragment, every line of it is so powerful that anyone who involves themselves with it must admit that it is art in its purest and greatest form. If you let the dialogue work on you, you will notice how differently the various personae speak, whether they have a passionate character with drive or whether they have a reserved, inhibited character. We see Goethe being able to make a start and aim for the greatest heights, but he then lacked the strength to go further. Although the task was too arduous for him to carry through, there is enough of it to get some idea of how deeply he had penetrated into the problems of educating the soul. He had a clear vision of everything the soul has to overcome in order to rise higher. He was aware of all that we became acquainted with yesterday with regard to anger and the fettering of Prometheus. He also knew of the things we have been speaking about today concerning the educator of the human soul, the sense of truth. How clearly related these two things are in their effects on the soul can be seen also in the facial expressions they call forth. Let us picture one person who is under the influence of anger, and another whom truth is acting, and another upon whom truth is acting, so that it works within as an inner light. The angry one is frowning. Why? In such a case, the brow is knitted because an excessive force is working within him like a poison to hold down a surplus of egoism which wants to destroy everything that exists apart from himself. The clenched fist is a demonstration of the wrathful self closed up in itself and refusing to go forth into the outer world. Now, compare this with the facial expression of the one who sees the truth. When he perceives the truth, he too may frown, but in his case he wrinkles his brow as a way of expanding his very self, as though the wrinkles would like to take hold of and suck in the whole world with devoted love. Observe, too, the eyes of a person who is trying to overhear the world's secrets. His eyes are shining, as though to encompass everything round him in the world outside. He is released from himself, and a person filled with the light of truth does not clench his hands, but holds them out with a gesture that indicates the sucking in of the world's being. The whole difference between anger and truth is seen in the physiognomy. On the one hand, anger thrusts people deeper into themselves. The striving for truth, on the other hand, leads to people opening up and connecting with the outer world. And this happens more and more, the more they turn from the truths acquired by reflective thinking to those gained by creative thinking. 
This is why Goethe, in his title Pandora, brings out the contrast between certain characters who can be seen to represent forces at work in the human soul. They show, uh, symbolically as it were, the interplay of the various soul capacities. When you look at the text of Pandora, you come upon something highly remarkable right at the start. The stage setting of the very first scene can strike you as being highly significant. On Prometheus's side of the stage, the scene is full of tools made by man, giving evidence of energetic human work. But it all looks somewhat rough and ready. On the side of the stage where Epimetheus, the other titan, is, it is quite different. Everything has reached a stage of perfection. For we not so much, so for we see not so much what human beings produce as creators, but rather a collection of things nature has already produced. It is all the result of reflective thinking. It is a collection and amalgamation, a symmetrical arranging of what exists in nature. Whereas Prometheus's scene is unsymmetrical and rough, Epimetheus's scene is one of natural harmony and beauty leading to a vista of a wonderful landscape. Why is it all arranged like this? We need only consider the two contrasting characters, Prometheus, the creative thinker, and Epimetheus, the reflective one. With Prometheus we find the products mainly of creative thinking. Here, although people's powers are limited and uncouth, they are productive. They cannot yet form their creations as perfectly as nature does, but they are all the outcome of their own powers and tools. But they have not got a sense for appreciating a natural landscape. With Epimetheus, the reflective thinker, we see the heritage of the past, which he himself has arranged symmetrically. And because he is a reflective thinker, we see in the background a beautiful landscape for people to enjoy. Then Epimetheus steps forward and reveals his particular nature by telling us that he is there to experience the past and to reflect on past experiences and what his eyes show him of the visible world. But in his monologue he admits to the dissatisfaction that this kind of attitude can, at times, call forth in his soul. He feels hardly any difference between day and night. In short, the figure of Epimetheus shows us reflective thinking in its most extreme form. Then Prometheus comes forward carrying a torch and emerging from the darkness of night. Following him, we see smiths who set to work on the man-made objects lying around, while Prometheus makes a remarkable statement that will not be misunderstood if we are alive to Goethe's meaning. The smiths praise productivity and welcome the fact that in the course of production some things have to be destroyed. They praise fire in a one-sided way, whereas a person who is a thoroughly reflective thinker will not praise one thing at the expense of another. He will look at the whole panorama. Prometheus, however, says straight away, quote, In partiality let the active man find his pleasure. Close quote. He praises precisely the fact that to be active entails the acceptance of limitations. In nature, the right thing is proved true when the wrong thing destroys itself. But what he impresses on the smiths is to go ahead with whatever they can do. He is the active one who emerges with his torch from the darkness of night in order to show that the truth acquired through creative thinking comes forth from the depths of his soul. Unlike Epimetheus, he is far removed from the dreamlike feeling that there is no difference between night and day, nor does he experience the world as a dream. For his soul has been at work, and it was in its own dark night that it first grasped the thoughts that emerge from it. They are no dreams but truths the soul has bled for. These are the means by which the soul advances into the world and breaks loose from itself. Yet at the same time it incurs the danger of losing itself. This does not apply as yet to Prometheus himself, but when a person introduces one-sidedness into the world, 
it becomes evident among his successors. Phileros, the son of Prometheus, already has the inclination to love and cherish the products of creative work, while his father Prometheus is still immersed in the stream of life's creative power. In Phileros we are shown the force of creative thinking developed in a one-sided way. Readers aside, Phileros is an interesting word. It's a connection of philos and eros, phil eros, end of readers aside. He rushes out into life, not knowing where to search for enjoyment. Prometheus cannot pass on to his son the enlivening strength of his creativity, and so Phileros appears incomprehensible to Epimetheus, who out of his own rich experience would like to counsel him in his headlong career. We are then shown further, in a magnificent way, what mere reflective thinking involves. Goethe links this with mythology, to where Zeus, having chained Prometheus to the rock, imposes Pandora, the all-gifted one, on humankind. Quote, Most beautiful and gifted, she approached the amazed watcher, moving with noble grace. Her gracious look inquiring whether I, like to my sterner brother, would repel her, but all too strongly were my heartbeats stirred. With sense bemused by charming bride I welcomed. Toward the mysterious dowry then I turned. The earthen vessel, tall and shapely, stood close-sealed. Prometheus had warned his brother against accepting this gift from the gods. But Epimetheus, being of a different character, accepts the gift, and when the earthen vessel is opened, all the afflictions that can befall humankind came pouring out. Only one thing remains in the vessel, hope. Who then is Pandora, and what does she signify? Truly a mystery of the soul is hidden in her. The fruits of reflective thinking are dead thoughts, an abstract reflection of the mechanical thoughts forged by Hephaestus. This wisdom is powerless compared to the universally creative wisdom with which the world abounds. What can this abstract reflection give mankind? We have seen how this kind of truth can be sterile and can lay waste the soul. Therefore we can understand that all the afflictions that beset human beings and that lay waste the human soul come pouring out of Pandora's vessel. In Pandora we have to see thought without the power of creativity. The truth of reflective thinking representing a mechanized thought picture in the midst of the world's creative life. Only one thing is left to the merely reflective thinker. While creative thinkers unite their ego with the future and break free from themselves in living for the future, reflective thinkers, with regard to the future, only have this one thing left them, to hope that things will happen. For, not being creative thinkers, they will have no part in shaping it. Goethe shows his deep comprehension of the myth by endowing the marriage of Epimetheus and Pandora with two children, Elpor, hope, and Epimelia, care, the one who safeguards existing things. In very fact, human beings have in their soul two offspring of dead, abstract, mechanically conceived truth. This kind of truth is unproductive and cannot work into the future, because it cannot be actively creative, but can only reflect what is already there. And the people who think them can only hope that what is true will duly come to pass. Goethe expresses this fact magnificently, realistically, in the figure of Elpora, who, if someone asks her whether one or another thing is going to happen, always answers, yes, yes. If a Promethean person were to speak of the future, he would say, quote, I hope for nothing, but will work out of my own forces to shape the future. Close quote. A reflective thinker, however, can only reflect on the past and hope for the future. So Alpora, when asked whether this or that will happen, always says, yes, yes. We hear it again and again. 
This is an admirable characterization of the daughter who represents a reflectively thinking soul and aptly shows her sterility. The other daughter of this reflective thinking, Epimelia, I'm going to say it that way, is the one who cares for existing things. She sets them all in symmetrical order and can add nothing from her own resources to what has come into being through living creative wisdom. But as everything that fails to develop is increasingly liable to destruction, we see care for them gradually mounting, and how through reflective thinking more and more of the destructive element finds its way into the world. Goethe characterizes this in a wonderful way by getting Phaleros to fall in love with Epimelia. We see him burning with jealousy, pursuing Epimelia, who finds refuge from him with the Titan brothers. Strife and discord come simultaneously onto the scene as Epimelia steps forward to announce that the person she loves is out to kill her. Every further word of the play goes on to show how deeply Goethe has delved into the soul mysteries of creative and reflective thinking. We see him showing so wonderfully the contrast between creative thinking, demonstrated by the smiths who transform nature, and the shepherds who take what nature offers. Therefore Prometheus says of the shepherds, they are seeking peace, but they will not find a peace that satisfies their souls. Quote, Go your ways in peace, but peace you will not find. Close quote. For the wish to preserve things as they are leads to the unproductive side of nature. The truths concerning creative thinking and reflective thinking, respectively, are thus set before us in the figures of Prometheus and Epimetheus, and in all the characters connected with them. They are representative of those soul forces which can spring from an excessive one-sided predilection predilection for one of the or the other way of striving for the truth. And after we have seen how disastrous are the consequences of these extremes, we are finally shown the one and only remedy, the cooperation of the Titan brothers. The drama continues with an outbreak of fire in a property owned by Epimetheus. Prometheus, who is prepared to demolish a building if it no longer serves its purpose, advises his brother to hurry to the spot and do all he can to halt the destruction. But all thought of this has deserted Epimetheus, and he is lost in the thought of Pandora. Also of interest is a dialogue between the brothers about her. Prometheus, quote, Her form sublime from ancient dark emerging came near me also. To make another like her, even Hephaestus would have failed in that. Epimetheus, Art thou too prating of this fabled birth? From ancient gods, a mighty race, she springs of Zeus himself. Prometheus, and yet Hephaestus, for her rich adornment, made for her head a net of shining gold, weaving with subtle hand the finest threads. Close quote. In every sentence spoken by Prometheus, we see that mechanized, abstract limitations obsess him. Then Eos, dawn, appears, preceding the sun. She heralds the sun, but already has its gold within herself. She does not only work from out of the darkness of night, but represents a transition to something which has overcome night. Prometheus appears with his torch, because he comes from out of the night. The artificial light he carries indicates that he creates out of the night. Epimetheus can indeed admire the gifts the sun brings, but he experiences everything as if it were only a dream. He is an example of pure reflective thinking. The way in which light can escape the attention of a soul absorbed in creative activity is shown by what Prometheus says in the light of the day. His people, he says, are called upon not merely to observe the sun and the light, but to be themselves a source of illumination. Now Eos, Aurora, comes forward. She calls upon human beings to be active and always to do what is right. Phileros, already having sought death, should unite with the forces which will make it possible for him to save himself. 
the smiths who are working within the limits of their creative thinking, and the shepherds who accept things as they are, are are now joined by the fishermen who take care of the element of water. And then we see Eos giving them advice, quote, Morning of youth, dawning of day, more beautiful than ever. From the unfathomed ocean I bring you now. Awake, shake off your sleep, you dwellers in the bay by cliffs encircled. You fishermen, arise and ply your craft. With speed spread out your nets around the well-known waters. A splendid catch is certain when my voice cheers you on. Swim, you swimmers, dive, you divers, watch, you watchers on the heights. May the shores and seas together swarm with swift, abounding life. Then we are shown in a wonderful way how Philoros, the son of Prometheus, having saved himself in the surging flood, unites his own strength with the strength of the waves. The active creative force in him is thus united with the creative sprouting force in nature. So the elements of Prometheus and Epimetheus are reconciled. In this way, Goethe offers a promising solution by showing that knowledge gained from nature by reflective thinking can be fired with productive energy by the creative thinking element. This latter acquires its rightful strength by receiving in a true form what, quote, the gods up there, close quote, bestow. Quote, take note of this. What is desirable you feel down here? What is to be given they know up there? You titans make a great beginning, but the way to the eternal good, the forever beautiful, that is the work of the gods. They ensure it. Close quote. The union of Prometheus and Epimetheus in the human soul will bring salvation both there and for humankind. The whole drama is intended to indicate that an all-round grasp of truth will satisfy the needs of the entire human race and not only individuals. Goethe wanted to show that an understanding of the real nature of truth will unite humankind and foster love and peace among them. Then hope, too, will be transformed in the soul. Hope, who says yes to everything, but is powerless to bring anything about. The poem was to have ended with the transformed Elpor, Elpor Thresia, stepping forward to tell us that she is no longer a prophetess, but is to be incorporated into the human soul, so that human beings will not merely cherish hopes for the future, but would have the strength to cooperate in bringing about whatever their own particular power can create. To believe in the transformation truth achieves in the soul, this is the whole magnitude of the truth which reconciles Prometheus and Epimetheus. Of course, in these sketchy indications, we were able to bring only very little of all that can be found in the poem. The deep wisdom that brought forth this fragment from Goethe's soul will only be discovered by those who approach it with the support of spiritual scientific thinking. They can then experience a sustaining, liberating stimulus that can be most enlivening. We must not omit a a mention of a remarkably beautiful statement Goethe included in his Pandora, which can also teach us a lot. He says that the divine wisdom of the world which streams down to us must work together with all that we are able to achieve through our own Promethean power of creative thinking. The element that comes to meet us in the world and tells us what wisdom is, Goethe calls the Word. However, the element that lives in the soul and has to unite with the reflective thinking of Epimetheus is what comes from Prometheus as deed. So we see the union of the Logos, or word, with the deed, giving rise to the ideal that Goethe wished to set before us in his Pandora as the fruit of his life of rich experience. Toward the end of the poem, Prometheus makes the remarkable statement, quote, What a true man celebrates above everything else is the deed. Close quote. This is the very truth that eludes the reflective element in the soul. Contemplating the impression the poem as a whole makes on us, 
we can come to appreciate the heroic yearning for development felt by people such as Goethe and the great modesty which prevents them from supposing that when they reach a certain stage they do not have to go beyond it. Goethe was his whole life long an apprentice in the art of living and always acknowledge the fact that when people have had an experience that has enriched them, they have to give up what they have previously held to be true. When, as a young man, Goethe was beginning to work on his Faust and had occasion to introduce some translations from the Bible, he decided that the words, quote, in the beginning was the word, close quote, should be rendered as, quote, in the beginning was the deed, close quote, and at that time, same time, he wrote a fragment of titled Prometheus. There we see the young Goethe as altogether active and Promethean, confident that simply by developing his own forces, not fructified by cosmic wisdom, he could progress. In his maturity, with all his life experience, he realized that it was wrong to underestimate the word and that the word must connect with the deed. In fact, Goethe revised his Faust while he was writing his Pandora. We can understand how Goethe came, by degrees, to maturity if we realize the nature of truth in all its forms. It will always be a good thing if human beings can wrestle their way to realizing that truth can be grasped only by degrees, or take a genuine, honest, all-round seeker after truth who is called upon to put across in life at all costs some truth he has discovered. It will be very good if he reminds himself that he has no grounds to pride himself on this account. There is no reason ever to remain content with something we know now. On the contrary, such knowledge as we have gained from our considerations yesterday and today should lead us to feel that although human beings must stand firm by the truth they have acquired and be ready to defend it, they must from time to time withdraw into themselves, as Goethe did. When we do this, all the forces arising from the awareness of the truth we have acquired will give us a sense for sizing things up and know where we should stand in relation to them. From the enhanced consciousness of truth, we should ever and again withdraw into ourselves and say with Goethe, much that we once discovered and took for truth is now only a dream a dreamlike memory, and what we think today will not survive a more thorough test. The words Goethe often said to himself with regard to his own honest search for truth may well be echoed by everyone in their solitary hours, quote, A poor weight am I, through and through. My thoughts miss the mark. My dreams, they are not true. Quote. If we can feel this, then we shall have the right relationship to our great ideals, to truth.